The next course that I'll be teaching starts in January and it's a weekly class called the City of Oxford 1850 to 1914. So it's a history of Oxford as a city rather than as the university. And so if any of you are interested in um, having a look at signing up for that, it would be really very nice to have you along. But in the meantime, I'd like to talk to you about how Oxford was changed by the coming of the railway. And first of all, what I'd like to do is to try and change the slide. There we go. Is to give a little bit of background to national railway development, just to set in context what I'm going to say later. And then how the railway actually came to Oxford in the first place. And then the effects that it had on the landscape, on trade and business, and on the population, on people, on the society, if you like. So, first of all, a little bit of background to national railway development. Well, railways, or I suppose you'd really call them horse-drawn tramways, actually first in, appeared in England soon after 1600, much earlier than I'd realised when I first started investigating this topic. They were mostly, of course, used uh, uh, on docks and in coal fields. They proliferated in the 18th and 19th centuries, and the first successful passenger-carrying railway was the Stockton to Darlington in 1825, and that really caused a worldwide sensation. It's generally acknowledged that the first, what we might call, mainline railway was five years later. That was the Liverpool to Manchester in 1830. And thereafter, a national network of railways was very quickly established. So between 1830 and 1851, over 6,000 route miles were laid. And there was this thing called railway mania, which you may have heard of, whereby something like the equivalent of £3 billion was invested in the development of railways, which were all private companies, of course. And much of it was invested by individuals. Fortunes were made, and indeed some fortunes were lost as well. And the development of the network was incredibly rapid. It doubled in size over the next 20 years, and it peaked at the eve of the First World War when there was something like 20,000 route miles in 1914. So in a relatively short space of time, really just one lifetime, the entire country witnessed the arrival and the rapid development of this major engineering project. And of course, that had far-reaching effects on the environment, on the landscape, on the economy, on business, and also on society. In terms of the environment, railway construction destroyed a lot of existing buildings and displaced many people from their homes. It's estimated that in London, about 100,000 people were made homeless by the coming of the various railways. That actually didn't happen in Oxford. The railway added large and impressive structures to both rural and urban landscapes, things of the size that people, apart from cathedrals, hadn't really ever seen before. So bridges, viaducts, tunnels, stations, locomotive sheds, all things on a fairly large scale. And as a result of that, and the rails themselves, took up a lot of space in towns and cities, and so changed their topography. And of course, in certain places, the railway actually came to dominate particular parts of a city or town. So in Swindon, for example, a town that became very much defined by its railways, Crewe, Stratford and East London were the same. And in some towns, it actually created divisions, didn't it? So you got areas that were on the wrong side of the tracks. In many cities, the fact that people could now uh, travel to work <coughs> relatively quickly, more than, and more than walking distance from work, from their homes rather, led to the development of the suburbs. And of course, railways also contributed to the growing pollution that was being caused by industry in general. Now, in terms of the economy, railway companies were major customers for several other industries. They generated trade, for example, for the construction industry, for foundries, for providers of accommodation and food and drink. They caused the demise of some trades, notably the coaching trade and the river and canal trades. But they encouraged the establishment and the development of other businesses by providing new ways of transporting raw goods and finished products relatively quickly in and out of wherever you were making your goods. And in terms of society, railway companies provided new kinds of employment, which led to changes in demographics as outsiders arrived in towns and cities to take up new jobs on the railway. They offered new opportunities, as I've said, of travelling to work, and the time saved meant a shortening of the working day for many ordinary people, and that contributed directly to the development of leisure for the working classes. 
They, some historians have actually uh, argued, uh, sorry, railways also, of course, contributed to the development of seasides in particular as le leisure destinations. But the idea of the day excursion by train became a very much a part of the working class social experience. Some historians have actually argued that railways led to, or contributed to the emancipation of women by allowing them to travel alone for the first time. And railways introduced new phrases into our language, many of which we still use today. So we talk about people being off the rails or things being along the right tracks, people letting off steam. All these are railway expressions. And railways actually changed the whole notion of time itself in this country because they prompted the introduction of standard Greenwich Mean Time. Before the arrival of the railways, most places just relied on local time and you couldn't travel quickly enough from one place to another for it to matter. And the clock at St Michael at the North Gate on Corn Market, as you can see here, actually had two minute hands, one showing local time, five minutes behind Greenwich Mean Time, and one showing Greenwich Mean Time. And that was very common. Places commonly just relied on their local time, which in Oxford was five minutes behind. But of course, once the trains came, you could travel quickly enough for it to matter. And also there had to be initially a regional, but later a national timetable, which you had to stick to. And therefore Greenwich Mean Time had to be adopted right across the country. So railways had huge and far-reaching effects, and that was true in Oxford as elsewhere. So let's look now at how the railway first came to Oxford. Well, the Great Western Railway was created by an Act of Parliament in 1835, and work started soon after on the London to Bristol line, under the supervision, of course, of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. And you can see the line snaking its way, if I can get my pointer to work, uh, from one side of the country across no I can't get my pointer to work IT man <laughs> you can can I point at the screen or will that mess things up um, so you can see it snaking across the country here and when the line from London uh, the line from London to uh, reach Steventon just to the west of Didcot in 1838 that meant now that travellers from Oxford just had to go about 10 miles by coach to meet the new railway at Steventon and from there to travel to London or later to Bristol. Now, the original prospectus for the line actually included a branch line to Oxford from Didcot. And you can see this dotted line here, which is that little branch line going about 10 miles north to Oxford. And the bill proposing that branch line was presented to Parliament in 1837. In fact, it was to be the first of three bills before the line was finally granted permission. It took six years for that to happen. The proposed line was to reach Oxford, or to approach Oxford rather from the south, and to terminate with a station near Magdalen Bridge, just to the east of the city centre, where the junction of Marston Street and Cowley Road now are. So this is what's now the Ifley Road coming down here. This is the Cowley Road, which at this point was almost totally unpopulated, and the station was to be just about here. This is the plain roundabout as we know it now and Magdalen Bridge. Now this meant, as you can see, going right through the ancient village of Ifley to the south here. And perhaps not surprisingly, object, uh, villagers objected to the route on the grounds that the proposed large cutting would badly affect their wells and actually cut people off from their fields. So this map, I'm sorry, is slightly confusing. North is over here, so if you imagine the whole thing turned on its side. Here's the line coming in from the south, and as you can see, the, the, it, passed, it was to pass very close to the village, and the fields were mainly over this side, so people would have been cut off from their fields by the cutting. Christchurch, the owners of much of the land to the north of Ifley, also objected to the line. The canal company objected to the whole idea of the railway, of course, out of concern for their business interests. And as a result, this initial bill was defeated. But a second bill followed swiftly a year later in 1838. This time, the university objected, fearing for the morals of its students. In particular, they were very worried about providing undergraduates with easy access to London, where they might be involved in improper marriages and other illegitimate connections. The Chancellor of the University, the D, uh, Duke of Wellington, had at first opposed all railways because he was worried that they would encourage the lower orders to move about. And indeed, other people at Oxford were very concerned about the influx of people into the city, visiting the colleges as tourists and lounging about the streets, generally making the place look untidy. 
Christchurch and other landowners still objected to the proposed route into the city. And so Brunel was forced to alter the line to approach to the west, well, still from the south, but to the west of the original line, to the west of the Abingdon Road, which you see coming down here from Folly Bridge, and to terminate with a station up here, not far from Folly Bridge, where it crosses the Thames. And this third bill was brought to before Parliament in 1842. There were still concerns over flooding around Kennington and the Abingdon Road. The city corporation, as forward-thinking as ever, argued that the railway was unnecessary. They just didn't see the point of having one. They thought they would never catch on. But, importantly, the university now dropped its opposition, probably because it knew that by now large numbers of students were travelling to Steventon and to board the train there. And, of course, at Steventon, the university had no jurisdiction. But with a station at Oxford, the university could exercise some control over students' travel plans. Moreover, the bill um, stipulated that university officials could patrol the station near Folly Bridge and actually physically prevent students from travelling to unsuitable places like Ascot. The railway company, moreover, was only allowed to sell undergraduates tickets to approved stations. And so this third bill was finally passed in 1843. And the opening of the line, not long after, the 12th of June 1844, caused enormous public excitement. In Hinksy Field and in South Hinksy, a special gala day took place, with marquees and tents and exhibitions, parties and celebrations went on late into the evening. Thousands of people gathered in areas adjacent to the railway and watched enthralled as the first public train arrived. It was described as one of those rampageous, dragonading fire devils, arrived at a sufficiently astonishing rate, and though gasping for breath and shining with heat, seemed to have turned not one hair more than was deemed proper by each spectator, even after its long and whirlwind chase. It's a wonderful description, isn't it? And it must have been incredible to see this train. People had probably never seen anything so big and so hot and so fast. People actually came just to see the track. The track in itself was as, uh, you know, enough of a phenomenon to draw the crowds, as it were. And you can see here uh, another confusing map with North over here this time, but here's the Abingdon Road coming over Folly Bridge, and here's the little station at Grand Pond. Now, that station was a fairly simple affair. It was a mainly wooden structure with two tracks coming in from the south, small wagon turntables at the terminus ends, because remember, this was the terminus of the branch line from Didcot, so the railway stopped here. It didn't go across the river at this point. A further three tracks led alongside, serving this large goods shed that we can see here, and then a single track continued 400 yards actually to the river bank, where there was a jetty and a crane to load and unload barges carrying coal and other goods. Stephen Quelch recalled the first railway <coughs> sorry, one of the first railway excursions to London from the Grand Pont station. They were all open carriages, something like the present cattle trucks with seats across. It started with a great number of passengers, about 10 in the morning, arrived at Paddington at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and immediately returned, reaching Oxford very late. So there you are, next time you're stuck on a train to Paddington, just be glad that you're not in something that looks like a cattle truck. Now, where this new railway line crossed the Abingdon Road, just north of Kennington, there was to be a bridge taking the road over the new railway. And I'm afraid I'm challenging you, your, your um, uh, whatever again, because this is north is now over here. So this is the railway line coming in north-south. And even more confusingly, at this point, the Abingdon Road swings round to go east-west. So this is the Abingdon Road, and this was to be where this new bridge was, which was to be built taking the road over the new railway. However, the building of this bridge was delayed by the Oxford's first nonconformist alderman and, his, and its second dissenting mayor, a man called John Towle, who was a bit of an eccentric. He was a paper maker, and you can see here his, his mill, Hinksy Mill, which was a paper mill. Now, John Towle was a Whig, and on hearing what he considered to be the Tory Great Western Railway was coming to Oxford, he erected, believe it or not, a paper house on the line of the proposed railway embankment, perhaps to get compensation or perhaps just to make life difficult for the railway company. When the railway inspector, Major General Pasley, found that one arch of this bridge carrying the, Ab carrying the Abingdon Road over the railway line was insecure, he noted in his report, Mr Brunel explained to me that the haste with which this arch of the bridge had been built was caused by the conduct of an individual in possession of part of the ground over which the embankment was carried 
who, after the site of the bridge had been decided on, erected what he called a house, which I saw but should never have guessed the use of. It was a small hut of timber framework covered with brown paper, with a fireplace in it, for the purpose of claiming compensation from the railway company for having diminished the value of his property. And the work was delayed as this unexpected claim could not be settled until near the period of the entire completion of all other parts of the railway. Now, this paper house was an extraordinary building. I don't know if any of you remember it. It actually survived until 1996. Now, houses with tarred paper roofs are actually not as unusual as you might think, particularly in a county like Oxfordshire, which, of course, is known for paper making because of the great number of printers and, um, and the, the book business in Oxford. But uh, what made John Towell's house unusual was that it had paper walls as well as a paper roof. And as Major General Pasley said in his report, originally it was just a two-bedroomed hut like this. This is from the report that Oxford Archaeology did when they dismantled it finally in 1996. But over the first 30 years of its life, it transpired that John Towell extended it in at least eight phases until it became a substantial five-bedroom villa, two-storied with a veranda and a conservatory on the outside, and a large spiral staircase going up the middle of it, not made of paper, I hasten to add. Now, in fact, John Towell's extraordinary house did not delay the opening of the railway. Major General Pasley directed that the old course of the Abingdon Road crossing the line on a level crossing should be kept until the new bridge and its approaches had been built properly and the railway opened on time. Whether John Towell ever received compensation or not is unclear. If he did, perhaps it was in gratitude that he named his house after the inspector, Paisley or Pasley House. Perhaps it was just a jibe. As I say, he was a bit of an eccentric. Now, in 1851... The Great Western's rival, the London and North Western, opened its line linking Oxford with the London to Birmingham line at Bletchley in Buckinghamshire. At Oxford, the new London to North Western line terminated at Rooley Road on the site of what had been Rooley Abbey. And it was planned to gain maximum publicity by opening the terminus station on the same day as the Great Exhibition at Crystal Palace in Hyde Park, the 1st of May, 1851. Of course, there was intense media and public interest in the progress of the Crystal Palace building. And at rather short notice, in December 1850, the London North Western Board invited Fox and Henderson, who were the engineers who were building Crystal Palace, to submit plans and a quote for a building of a station on the plan of the exhibition building in all respects. Now, the timetable was extremely tight. The tender was accepted only in the second week in January, the building had to be completed by the 1st of May so that the London North Western could run special excursion trains to the opening of the Crystal Palace from our version of the building here in Oxford. However, as late as the 10th of April, Christchurch had still not agreed to part with the land at the Rooley Abbey site. And so, so perhaps not surprisingly, the station didn't quite open on time. But here it is, and some of you may remember it. This is where the Said Business School is now. Uh, later in its life, it became a tyre depot, so if you do remember it, you may remember it in that phase of its life. But here's a picture of it um, earlier on, uh, actually, I think probably about 30 years after it was built, still with uh, some nice carriages in front of it. And here's another picture of it from above, when it had become part of the London, Midland and Scottish network. The station was closed to passengers exactly 100 years after it had opened in 1951 and partly demolished. And then, of course, it was finally dismantled in 1999 to make way, as I said, for the Said Business School. And it's actually been relocated to the Railway Museum, the Buckinghamshire Railway Museum at Quainton. I don't know if any of you have been to see it, but it now forms part of their visitors' centre. Um, and it's been very nicely put back there, in fact. And it was saved, of course, because it's a listed building, listed grade two star, a quite high, um, quite high listing partly because of this connection that it was made by the same engineers who made Crystal Palace and using some of the same innovative building techniques that they used to make Crystal Palace. Now, that station is no longer in Oxford, but another structure from the London North Western's original line is, and it's this, the Swing Bridge, built in the same year, 1851, to designs by Robert Stevenson to carry the London North Western line over the Sheepwash Channel, which is a navigation cut which links the river and the canal. It pivots on a central turntable, 
uh, placed on one side of the channel to allow boats through. And you see it here open so that boats can pass along here. So here are the rails coming in. This is the swing bridge, which would swing around like this to continue the tracks, but it's open at the moment to allow a, a boat to travel along this channel of the river. Apparently, a couple of years after the swing bridge was installed, a railway engine toppled into the water, the driver having failed to realise that the bridge was open. I imagine that that would have been his last day at work, probably. As I say, this swing bridge still exists, and it's... Oh, dear. Have I just pushed the wrong thing? Sorry. <laughs> Don't press anything else. <laughs> it's okay to keep the TV turned on. Actually go up. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. No, no, it's still there. Is it this one? No, that one. Okay, I'll just carry on. <laughs> so, uh, where are we? Thank you very much. No, I've, no, I've, I can't work out which way this thing's pointing. Okay. Is that to get me to the next one? Yes, okay. So, here's the swing bridge as it is today. Um, and you may notice these two um, capstans, I suppose you'd call them, on either side of it, about halfway along its length. There's one here and one here. And they have geared wheels on the top of them, te teethed wheels. And along the top here is a horizontal bar. And these they are the mechanism by which the swing bridge was opened and closed. So basically, this horizontal bar, which has square ends, you fitted a sort of Z-shaped handle onto each end, either side of that teeth gear wheel, and then two men, one facing one way, the other facing the other, would turn like this, and the whole thing would swing around because the motion from this gear wheel is transmitted all the way down to underneath where there's a complicated set of gear wheels which turn the entire bridge. It weighs 85 tonnes, but it was so well balanced and so well designed that two or three men could open and close it, apparently in the space of five minutes, uh, in order to allow a boat to pass through now, I'm really going to push the bounds of technology now and try and show you a video of this happening. Let's see if whether this works. Uh, oh, there's the, the capstan in uh, bigger. Is it listed? Is it listed? Yes, it's a yeah. scheduled national monument, actually. I don't think this will work, will it? Is it quite sound? No. Okay, it's not going to, I'm sorry. Sorry? It was showing lots earlier. Was it? I seem to be slightly... In this room. Yeah, OK, never mind. It was a video of it happening, but let's not worry. So this is the, uh, a close-up of the swing bridge bed, which was rebuilt on several occasions around the turn of the century, probably to take heavier and heavier locomotives. Now, like the station which it served, this swing bridge was closed to passenger traffic in 1951, although it actually remained in operation until the nearby goods yard closed in the mid-1980s. But it is one of only two swing bridges to be national scheduled monuments. The other is near Newcastle and is actually much younger, 1876, and it's hydraulically operated, whereas ours is 1851 and hand operated. And although it looks rather sad at the moment, it's awaiting, I wouldn't say restoration, because it will never move again and it's open to allow boats through, but it's awaiting conservation, let's say, um, by the Oxford Preservation Trust, by its owners, which are Network Rail, English Heritage are also involved, and various other bodies as well. So, the, great, the London North Western had opened its line in 1851, and in 1852, the great, sorry, in 1850, a year earlier, the Great Western extended its line north into the Midlands. And you can see it running up here. So this is the original line taking us to that little station in Grand Pont that I showed you earlier on. And then in 1850, this line was built over the river and up to join with the Midlands. And this was part of Brunel's great push into the Midlands. Now, of course, this meant that trains arriving in Oxford, say from the south, had to go up here to the station, deposit anyone that was getting off at Oxford, and then reverse back to the Millstream Junction, as it was called, and then continue the journey on north. And similarly, coming in the other direction, you'd come down to here, stop, reverse up to the station for Oxford passengers, and then continue. So this little station at Grand Pont became very inconvenient. And so in 1852, 
the Great Western built itself a new station right next door, in fact, to the um, London and North Western Station. So this is the existing London North Western Station, the Crystal Palace one. And here, right next door to it, on the site of our current railway station, was the new Great Western Station. So for a short time, you actually had three stations in Oxford, although this one almost immediately closed to, well, it did immediately close to passenger traffic. It continued as a goods station until 1872, and that's when Broad Gauge, which is, of course, what Great Western was on. Does anyone tell me how broad Broad Gauge was? Seven, seven seven foot and a quarter. Very good, seven foot and a quarter, that's right. Whereas Standard Gauge, which is what we travel on, Four for eight and a half, thank you very much, uh, is what eventually won out, and that's, of course, what we, what we travel on now. So Broad Gauge was dismantled, and, um, and at that point, the, um, the track of the, was, that was here was taken up, and the, uh, the land was then available for housing. But the new station, which was at the, uh, the northern end there, um, sorry, I'm using the wrong pointer, that's the old station, that's the Mill Stream Junction, and there are the two new stations. And the new station, here's part of the plan for it, and you can see it just had two fairly short platforms, and then any number of cloak rooms and waiting rooms and refreshment rooms all dotted around, all, of course, divided into first, second and third classes, and divided into men and women as well, or rather into ladies and gents. And here's a picture of the Great Western Station. Right. Here he is. We've found you again, sir. Edward VII, or rather the Prince of Wales later, the Ed Edward VII, in 1897, uh, as I say, on a state visit to open Oxford's new town hall, in fact. And uh, this is a red carpet onto which he and his horse are presumably about to step. Now, quite what he was doing at the train station on a horse is a bit of a mystery, but anyway, maybe his train was cancelled. So, as I say, that, that little station <laughs> at Grandpont uh, was closed as a result of this new station, uh, the track was taken up and the land was given over to a housing development known as Grand Pont. And the um, station site, which you can see here, was at the end of what's now become Western Road, which was so named at, after the Great Western Road, uh, it's Great Western Railway, sorry, and Marlborough Road, which runs up here parallel to the Abingdon Road, was built on what had been the former railway embankment. So those, are the, uh, those of us that live on Marlborough Road, this is my house here, we have this peculiarity where we go in the front door of our houses through the hallway then down into one room and then down into the next one. And that's true on either side of the road because the houses are sort of clinging onto the side of what was originally the railway embankment. So our gardens are about six feet lower than the, than the, 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 the front doors, as it were. So, oh, no, hang on, sorry. Sorry. So we had a little bit more development of the railway network slightly later on when a number of halts were put in place. These were like sort of little mini stations. This was in 1908. And the idea of these was to, to give a, a steam rail motor service, as it was called, to provide flexible local rail services actually within the city. And the important thing about these rail motors, and you can see a picture of one there, was that they incorporated the engine and the passenger compartment all in one vehicle. So rather than having a separate engine pulling carriages, as had been traditional before. And there were various halts, as you can see on this map around here. Ifley Halt was originally going to be called Oxford Sewage Bridge Halt, uh, <laughs> until, it was, uh, until it was decided that perhaps that wasn't such a, a great idea. And you can see various other halts dotted around the line. However, the halts were rather short-lived, or the rail motor service, I should say, was rather short-lived. It ceased after just five year, sorry, seven years in 1915, mainly because of competition from motor buses, which were introduced by an enterprising young man called William Morris in 1914. And, of course, we know that what the effect that he then went on to have on the city as a whole. However, perhaps ironically, the later development of motor Morris, uh, Morris Motors and Press Steel um, in the, to the south of the city resulted in what had been the Garsington Holt or Garsington Bridge Holt being developed as the Morris Cowley Station in 1928. And there's talk, I think, of reopening that station actually to the south of the city. So the rail system was pretty well established in Oxford, certainly by the 1850s, and we've seen some of the physical effects that it had over the next 60 or so years in terms of buildings and structures that were erected to serve it. But what effect did the railway's arrival have on the city economically? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, the coaching trade was an early victim. 
In 1835, when Oxford was at its zenith as a coaching centre, there had been 240 coach services a week in and out of the city. Among the leading coaching inns in the centre of town were these, the Star, the Angel and the Mitre, which were so busy that they were described as being themselves tributary towns within the city. The coming of the railways to Oxfordshire led to an immediate reduction in coach services in and out of Oxford. Initially, the coaching firms tried to adapt by running services from Oxford to meet the new railway at Steventon. And when the first railway line to Oxford itself opened in 1844, many observers compared it very unfavourably with the coach service. In particular, there were complaints that the ticket prices were far too high. This is a, a letter to Jackson's Oxford Journal. The fares, however, to London, 15 shillings and 10, are much too high and will materially operate against the line, more especially when the public have the opportunity of sitting behind Charles Holmes and his splendid greys all the way into town through beautiful country for only five shillings. The rail will, in consequence, be no boon to the humble tradesman or mechanic and is not likely to be patronised much, except by those who have ample means or urgent business to transact. But, of course, the thing about the railway was that you could get to London in something like two hours and 20 minutes, even then. And so, despite initial scepticism, the railway soon reduced and eventually put an end to Oxford's once great coaching trade. Within 10 years, there were only three coaches a week left to London. A correspondent to the local paper, talking of those coaching inns, bemoaned the plight of the fallen angel and the extinguished star. And when competition came from the railways, the Oxford Canal actually at first withstood it. And there were various reasons for that, one of which was that many manufacturers actually preferred to send goods by canal, particularly things that were easily damaged by railway shunting. So fairly fragile things like slabs of coal, pottery, slate and chemicals. And the canal company also had a large pottery warehouse at its wharf and so was able to, good, to offer good storage for pottery in particular. However, lower profit margins meant that the canal company's position gradually declined Long distance haulage was reduced and if we look at these extracts from the trade directories we can see that in 1852 the vast majority of coal merchants still had their businesses at the canal wharf whereas by 1882, 30 years later, they'd nearly all migrated either to the Great Western or to the London and North Western. And it says there Great Western, London, North Western wharf and if we look at this map or plan of the London North Western Station, you can see those wharves, so landing places, in other words, not on the water, but on rails, pointed out on the drawing there. So by 1928, there was very little trade left on the canal, and in 1937, the wharf at New Road was sold, and later Nuffield College and the Worcester Street car park were built on the site. So the railway had, of course, negative effects on alternative forms of transport, but it promoted the development of other industries for whom, as it said, it enabled a relatively quick and cheap transport of raw products in and of finished goods and residual products out. So as in other towns and cities, the arrival of the railway encouraged the establishment of new breweries, for example, and the opening of brewers' agents, whose job it was to arrange for the transport of beers from far-flung breweries into the city. So by the mid-1870s, there were something like nine commercial breweries in um, Oxford, nine separate breweries, and 13 other brewers' agents. And we can see some of them listed here. And they are, you might notice, concentrated in the areas of St Thomas and to some extent St Ebbs, which was really the part of Oxford around the railway stations. And the proximity to the railway was certainly an attraction. Here's a notice of auction of the Eagle Steam Brewery on Park End Street, and you'll notice that one of, the, one of the selling points is that it's in close proximity to the stations of the London North Western and Great Western Railways. Other associated businesses soon grew up. So this is Hanley's City Brewery's Maltings, which were built on Beckett Street, just, to the, um, just ad adjacent to the two railway stations. And you'll see here this um, engraving showing how close to the railway tracks the maltings were and showing railway carriages uh, bringing the raw product, the grain, right up to the doorway of the malt house and indeed enabling the, the finished product, the malt, to be carried away. This is where the station car park is now, for any of you that know, well, these tracks are rather, where the station car park is now, for those of you that know Oxford. 
Other businesses also began to congregate in the area of the station. So this, for example, was Archer Cowley and Co. They were furniture packers and removals firm. And here we can see them advertising how their furniture vans could be transported by rail. So here's a furniture van on the back of a railway carriage. Now, at this point, when these two advertisements were, um, were written, they were actually in Pembroke Street, just off St Aldate's. But in 1901, Archer Cowley built itself this very impressive new furniture packing and storage warehouse on Park End Street, very near the stations. Two years later, another major addition to the area was, of course, Frank Cooper's Marmalade Factory, which, uh, he, where he moved his marmalade-making business from the high street to this impressive purpose-built factory, which was sited in a very prominent position directly opposite the two railway stations. And you can see here a van po poised to come out of the entrance to Frank Cooper's and drive literally just a few yards into the LMS, as it was by this time, station entrance way. And, of course, that meant that raw, it was very easy to get raw materials into um, the factory, sugar and oranges and so forth, and to take the finished product away and to distribute it across the nation via rail. The railway also encouraged visitors and tourists into the city, just as the university had at first feared. And St Giles' Fair in September was a particular time for that, when special trains brought visitors from as far afield as Birmingham, Wolverhampton and even Cardiff. And tourists from even further afield also came. Here's rather a nice cartoon of Americans in Oxford. The first American is saying, do you reckon this car will put us down at the famous Oxford University? The second American is saying, hustle round Ma, our train leaves for Stratford in 30 minutes. <laughs> so there you are, nothing much changes. And you can see in the background, perhaps, Frank Cooper's Marmalade Factory is just on the other side of the car, as she calls it, by which she means a tram. But this double gabled building here actually says Railway Hotel, and that was a real hotel, Jones's Railway Hotel. You can see it in this picture here. And this was one of a clutch of at least nine railway temperance and commercial hotels which opened in the latter decades of the 19th century around the stations in order to provide accommodation for visitors. None of those so-called railway hotels survive, but there are several very close to the stations which still do. Right opposite what's now the Said Business School is the Castle Temperance Hotel. Um, just under the railway bridge on the Botley Road is Dodson's Temperance Hotel, which is still a hotel. It's now called the Westgate. And Flory's Commercial Hotel is just around the corner on Beckett Street, as you can see there. And, of course, railways in general had a huge effect on or impact on tourism. For the first time, day trips to the countryside and to events in other towns and cities, even a week's holiday at the seaside, were within the grasp of the working classes. And excursions like these became incredibly popular. So the railways brought not only new visitors to Oxford, but they also brought new residents, both temporary and long-term. And this had a significant effect on the size and the makeup of Oxford's population and on the consequent development of the suburbs. So first of all were the navvies, navigators or railway labourers, the men who laid the track, built the tunnels, the bridges, the viaducts, the cuttings, the embankments and so forth. And as you probably know, the name navigator was first applied to those who built the canals, but later it became associated with the men who laboured on the railways. And the navvies were a, a rather peculiar people, perhaps a bit like gypsies or canal boatmen. They had their own slang and distinctive dress. They lived on site in temporary camps of tents and, hut, hunt, and huts. And between jobs, they tramped across the country in search of new work, sheltering in derelict buildings, in farm outhouses, in families, in taverns, and in cheap lodging houses. And navvies were notoriously hard drinking. Locals sometimes resented them because they were paid twice as much as other labourers, and they sometimes got into fights in pubs, very often over local women. However, the railway companies endeavoured to improve navvies' moral standing, and their reputation as troublemakers was by no means always justified. The Reverend Fremantle, the chaplain to the London North Western Railway Workers at Oxford, declared in 1851 that a more sober, industrious and well-conducted body of men could not be found anywhere. Here, here. The contractor, Mr Brassey, had told him, in answer to an inquiry, that no money made such a good return as that expended by employing scripture readers along the lines <laughs> of the works. But they are. I think they should be employed on every building site and see what happens. 
So the railways brought an influx of these sometimes rather troublesome navvies, but they also encouraged other migrants into the city from rural Oxfordshire and indeed beyond. And the advent of the railways was one of a number of factors which caused the population of Oxford to more than double between 1841 and 1901. And that went hand in hand with the rapid development of the suburbs all around the city's medieval core, what the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins disparagingly called Oxford's base and brickish skirt. So, for example, the presence of that very first railway in, uh, to the south of Folly Bridge led to the development of this little island of housing about half a mile along the Abingdon Road called New Hinksey. So here is Folly Bridge and the Abingdon Road. And as you can see, this little square of housing arrived in the 1850, early 50s before any of this, before the Grand Pond housing estate was built up later on on what had been the line of the railway. The opening of the London North Western Station at the eastern end of the Botley Road in 1851 and the adjacent Great Western Station the following year, of course, brought a demand for railway workers, uh, sorry, from railway workers for local housing. And a man called G.P. Hester, who was actually the town clerk, saw the opportunity for making some money. And in 1851, he bought a parcel of land south of the Botley Road and west of the river. So this bit here and here are the two stations, just one beside the other. He named the area Osney Town or Osney Island and he brought in vast quantities of earth and rubbish to raise the land above flood level. He divided it into plots and a number of plots were sold off rapidly by October 1852, less than a year later. Um, the, the island was almost covered by modest terraced houses like these ones. Unfortunately, the raising of the land was not entirely successful and the development soon became known as Frog's Island. However, the proximity to the two railway stations ensured its popularity, and by 1861, ten years later, almost half the households in Osney Island contained at least one person who worked on the railway. And Osney, indeed, was known as a railway enclave well into the 20th century. It was said, oh, you couldn't get a house down there because it was all the railway. Of course, the railways brought the opportunity for new kinds of jobs, which attracted young men, both locals and incomers, many of whom regarded it as a great privilege to work there. The prospects of reasonable pay and promotion were good. It was a rapidly expanding industry. And, of course, most valuable of all were the security of employment and the regularity of payment, which the railway companies could offer and which were relatively rare at that time. So if we look at an extract from the census for East Street on Osney Island, if you just run your eye down here in the professional occupation column, you can just see how many people worked, in this case, on the Great Western Railway. And this is replicated throughout the census uh, across the island. A promotion on the railway was achieved almost entirely by its seniority. So jobs like that of engine driver, which was really the sort of top job, um, as occupied here by a man called William Broadside in um, East Street, uh, Broad Rib, sorry, in East Street, tended to be occupied by men who were in their 40s or 50s, who'd been working on the railway probably since they left school at 14, had undergone a lengthy training and had reached the top of the tree, as it were, simply by, sti by sticking to their, to their job. And, of course, this was one of the few industries at the time to offer the chance of actually moving around the country while still working for the same company. So most men moved from station to station, often because of promotion. Sometimes, it has to be said, as a punishment. But we can see from the birthplaces of Mr Broadrib's children that he has moved from Weymouth to Paddington to Swindon to Reading and thence to Oxford over the previous... 20 years. You can see that each of his children is born in one of those places. His sons, Edward and Frank, have followed him in becoming railwaymen themselves, a ticket collector and a number taker. And indeed, many sons followed their fathers onto the railway. There was a strong sense of camaraderie between employees, and which was reinforced by the fact that many lived nearby, were related to each other and met socially in local pubs and clubs and played sports together, as we see here. And so the proximity of the railway station, those two railway stations, had a strong influence over the development of the rest of the Victorian suburb of West Oxford. So following the early development of Osney Island down here, development gradually spread west 
along the Botley Road. Well, actually, some, in some cases, in sort of jumps and starts. So you get a little island of housing out here being developed a little bit earlier. And in 1879, houses on the Cripley Road estate, which is this bit up here, just to the west, immediately to the west of the station, were being advertised in Jackson's Oxford Journal as capitally suited to the businessman to whom time is an all-important object. Half a minute will suffice to catch a train. So a nice demonstration there of how commuting was becoming a reality in the 1870s for people living in Oxford uh, to work in London. So people came to Oxford to work on the railway and many of them settled, many of them in these newly developing estates off the Botley Road. And in 1865, it seemed that the Great Western might become Oxford's major employer and might bring considerably more people, more railway workers, into the city. A plan was put forward to site the company's carriage-making workshops here. This was expected to provide something like 1,500 new jobs. The City Corporation, which, as you, as you may remember, had objected to the railway 30 years earlier, was so keen to find new employment for its citizens that it offered the lease of Crickley Meadows, which was just to the north of the stations, just up here, for the siting of these new carriage works. So this is where the carriages for, for the trains would actually be built and furnished. But there was a sharp clash with the university, which opposed the scheme on the grounds that it would alter the city and disrupt the seclusion which it felt was so necessary to the collegiate system. And a sort of propaganda war was waged between, or rather against, the corporation and the Great Western, with, tra with letters appearing in the national press. And here's one example from the Times. Everywhere the spirit of business and the clouds of smoke in which it delights are penetrating. It is well that it should be so, but surely if there's one place which may justly ask to be protected from it, that place is Oxford. Do the scholastic quiet, the half-medieval repose, the harmonious surroundings which lead to thoughts the busy 19th century world is too apt to lose sight of, count for nothing in the education art she offers? Are our gardens even to approximate in sootiness to a London square, where to smell a rose is an act of daring? Is our river to be further defiled by the drainage of 7,000 new inhabitants? As you can see, people got really wound up about this idea that there might be 1,500 new you know, Great Western mechanics coming in with their families, even worse. Some citizens, however, argued that outer parishes gain very little from the university and that sober and industrious Great Western mechanics would prove rather more worthwhile than the idle and luxurious class brought into Oxford by the university for just six months of every year. In the end, a sudden change of chairmanship at the Great Western led to the dropping of the scheme, probably for financial reasons. Crickley Meadow flooded regularly, as indeed it still does, and it would have cost the company a huge amount to alleviate the problem. And so the carriage works went instead, does anyone know? Swindon. To Swindon, that's right, you're all very knowledgeable. And if you've been, some of you will have been, to STEAM, which is the wonderful um, uh, Great Western Museum at, at Swindon, and you can see, can't you, a layout of these carriage works and, and see exactly what was, uh, what was going on in them. It's very interesting. The failure to obtain the carriage works here in Oxford left a feeling of great depression in the city and much resentment against the corporation and the university. And of course we had to wait another 50 years, didn't we, before sort of real industry arrived in the form of William Morris's car factory. So just to conclude, the railway had many effects on Oxford as it did elsewhere. It added large and impressive structures to the urban landscape stations and bridges. It prompted the erection of some more eccentric buildings like John Towell's paper house. It took up a lot of space and affected the layout and topography of Oxford. And it played a major part in the development of the suburbs, particularly in West Oxford. In terms of economics, it prompted the demise of some trades, in particular coaching and canal transport. But it encouraged the establishment and the growth of others including brewing and malting, marmalade making, removals firms, and a large number of hotels. And of course, if the Great Western had been allowed to build its carriage works here instead of at Swindon, Oxford might have become a major manufacturing centre 50 years earlier than it actually did. Socially, the railway provided new opportunities for employment. It brought navvies and railway workers to the city and changed the makeup of the population. It also brought in tourists and other visitors, 
and it offered Oxford's working citizens the chance to travel on day excursions and later on holidays away from home. The advent of train travel contributed to a period of tremendous economic, political and social upheaval, and like all towns and cities, Oxford was changed forever by the coming of the railway. Thank you very much.